We've been on this subject for some weeks now called God's will to heal. God's will to heal. And I'm more excited about it than when we started. Are you? Luke chapter 5 is our text. And in verse 12, Luke 5, 12, it came to pass when he, Jesus, was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Have you heard that phrase before? Lord, if you will, or if it's your will, or if it be your will, you can. Lord, I believe you can. I know you can, if you will. This is how millions of Christians pray today concerning healing and concerning all things. And it's taught from the pulpit that you should pray that way. That you should pray all prayer with and if it be thy will. But that simply is not true. And people that say that don't practice it. Hmm? They don't. When people come down to the altar to get saved, they don't pray, you know, you know, for them to be saved if it be the will of God or, or tell them to confess Jesus as their Savior if it be the will of God. They're not consistent in what they say. That's right. come on. Right. Come on. Well, except for that, everything. No, no, you got to be consistent now. If you're supposed to pray with an if it be thy will about everything, then that means everything. Somebody said, well, Jesus prayed that way in the garden. I know it. And they were not having a healing meeting in the garden. That's right. That's right. Were they? No. no, when he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And that was right. And that's a good example for us to submit and consecrate to the will of God in service for him. But did you ever see him pray that way about somebody's healing? Did you ever see any of the apostles in the book of Acts pray that way about a healing? No. No. Because the will of God has been revealed. Hmm? If you don't know the will of God, well then okay. You pray that way, you don't know. But... When the Bible tells you what his will is, you shouldn't ignore that and keep praying with an if it be thy will. Right. How many don't pray concerning people to be saved if it's God's will? Right. You don't pray that way. Right. You would never tell somebody it might be God's will to save you. It might not. We don't know. No. But we'll just pray for you and see. No, no. Hmm? Well, how are we going to know? Well, if you saved, then we know it was God's will. If you lost, then we know it wasn't. And yet, people pray that way about healing. Don't they? And people are confused. Now, we've gone over this repeatedly, but it, it bears much repetition. How can we find the will of God? How? The Word of God reveals the will of God. Say that out loud. The Word of God reveals the will of God. Not your experience or lack of experience. Not somebody else's experience. How are you going to find the will of God? Hmm? Now, of course, there's a lot of people that just believe you can't know the will of God. That the will of God is unknowable to us mere mortals. And yet, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible said, for instance, in Ephesians 5, don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Why did he give us the Bible if he didn't want us to know his will? Why did he give us the Holy Teacher, the Holy Spirit? Hmm? If he didn't want us to know his will, all he had to do is nothing. (laughs) 
Not give us the Holy Spirit. Not give us the Bible. And we'd have just been as dumb and dark and ignorant as could be. No. That's why he gave us the Bible. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. He wants us not to be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's Ephesians 5, 17. Now, uh, Jesus, when this man came to him and said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Did he answer him? And what did he tell him? Verse 13, he put forth his hand and he touched him and he said, hmm? Well, <laughs> you just never know what God's going to do. And we just want to submit to Him. If it's not His will. Now this is how millions of Christians pray. And people get upset if you say anything other than that's okay. But it's not what Jesus said. It's not how He operated. It's not how people in the book of Acts operated. Because the will of God has been revealed. Amen. He reached forth His hand. He touched him. Tell me what Jesus said. What did he say? Jesus said, I will. I will. I will. Two words that loom above the barbed wire entanglement of men's reasoning. Two words that though heaven and earth pass away, they shall remain forever and ever, no matter how many degrees people get and how many books they write and how many experiences and theories they have. Two words, two words. Two words. Red letters trump everything. Two words loom above it all. What are those words? I will. I will what? He said, I know you can heal me if you will. What did Jesus say? I will be clean. And he touched it and he was healed. Now here's the thing. Somebody said, yeah, but now that, that was Jesus. Yeah, and he still is Jesus. And he still is no respecter of persons. And he still is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he tell him I will and tell you I won't, then it's different. If he'd say, I will then, but he says, I won't now, he's changed. People don't like it that plain, but that's how it ought to be. I will is the revealed will of God. It is the unchanging will of God for all men, for all time, just like you are absolutely sure it's God's will for all to be saved, you ought to be absolutely sure it's God's will for all to be healed. Somebody said, yeah, but not all are healed and not all are saved. That's right. But how do we ascertain the will of God? The Word of God. Now, how many people could we find out about that died without Jesus and were lost before we decide it's not always His will to save? How many people would you have to see or hear about that died lost before you'd go, well, there's just too many dying lost. It's obvious. It's not always his will for them to be saved. Huh? Hmm? Well, no. Why? Because your, your, your knowledge of his will is not based on who leaves this life saved or unsaved. You found his will Where? And you found where he said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of him, right? And so I don't care if 90 million people died lost, it was still his will for all of them to be saved. Well, how many people, how many Christians do you, would it take for you to see that struggling and in lack and don't have enough before you decide, well, it's not always God's will for Christians to prosper? Do you see this? What are we talking about? 
How many? Well, I just see too many Christians, too many of my brothers and sisters that are struggling. It couldn't be the will of God for us all to be rich because I know people everywhere that's broke and poor and they love God. Their experience does not prove the will of God. Amen. Their lack of experience does not prove the will of God. Amen. Hmm? Amen, sir. How many people do we have to see sick before we decide, well, it's not always God's will to heal? I know I'm just saying it different ways and I'm going over it again and again, but it is so important. Millions of people, Christians that love God, good people, still praying like this leper right here. Obviously didn't read the next verse. Didn't see where the question got answered. Or it wasn't good enough for them. But even though they saw it, didn't mean anything to them because they have seen all of this other stuff. And they have experienced or lack. Well, so-and-so, they prayed and, and they didn't get healed. Well, so-and-so prayed and didn't get saved. Well, so-and-so didn't prosper. What does it mean? It does not prove the will of God. Amen. Amen. Tell me how you find the will of God. The word of God. One place. Word. One place. The Word of God reveals the will of God. And if every one of us in this church never experienced it, it would still be the will of God. Yes. Right? Yes. If every one of us died lost and went to hell, it'd still be God's will for everybody to be saved. Yes. Yes. If every one of us is broke all our life, it's still the will of God for us all to be rich. Yes. 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 Huh? Yes. Your experience doesn't prove the will of God. Your lack of experience doesn't prove the will of God. Oh, but if you'll agree with him. I said, if you'll agree with him and say, yes, I know I don't see it. I know I don't feel it, but I believe it. Elevate my life to match this. Bring me up to this. I'm claiming it. I'm believing I receive it. I'm holding on to it, and I'm going to go ahead and call it that way right now. I know I'm standing in the basement, but I'm going to push the 15th floor button. Right? I'm gonna, I know I am not on the 15th floor. But I know I can get there, and it's your will for me to get there, so just keep pushing that button going. All right. All right. Huh? Well, I said to, I said to the thermostat, you know, an hour ago, and I'm still hot. Yeah, but it's, it's coming. Right? And I mean, we got enough sense to know if the house been shut up for three days in the middle of the summer, and it's 105 degrees in there. You don't just flip the, the thermostat and go, whoo, it's chilly in here. It's going to take a while, right? It's going to take a while. And when you've been going the wrong way for the last 40 years in unbelief and fear, it might take more than a day or two <laughs> for you to get turned around, but it will happen if you'll put God's Word first in your life. I think we're getting somewhere. Don't you? Tell me again, how can you find the will of God? What about what people have experienced or didn't experience or what happened to them or didn't happen to them? None of that proves the will of God. The word is still true. Hmm? Like Romans say, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Anybody that says anything different is wrong. Because he's right. And he's always right. No matter what you think. He's right. Every time. <laughs> I had a person tell me one time, well, I'm tired of him being, not talking about another person, I'm tired of him being right all the time. I said, well, is he right or not? Well, yeah, but I'm tired of it. Well, <laughs> you better get over it. Because <laughs> God is right all the time. All the time. And the sooner you agree with him, the better off you're going to be with every one of us. Can you say amen? So we have begun going through the word, giving 30, 30, 30 biblical reasons, 30 reasons from the scriptures. If the word of God reveals the will of God, then we need to get the scriptures on it. Establishing 30 reasons 
that we know it's God's will for all to be healed today. If somebody says, well, I don't believe that, get them to give you 30 reasons from the Bible why they are sure it's not his will always to heal. From the Bible. Not their theory in the pit, from the Bible. Not somebody's denominational dogma or, or out of somebody's theology book, from the Bible. And so we've been clipping right along, right? <laughs> Not too fast. Uh, we saw God's word is medicine. A strong spirit will sustain you. The original creation. God's will in heaven. The origin of sickness. We saw sickness as the work of the devil. Not my words. Four verses. We, we saw that say it, and there are many more. We saw that we have a covenant of healing. Right? We saw the eternal names of God. We saw that sickness is a curse. And we've been redeemed from the curse. We saw that there's healing in the types of redemption, and that unfolded and revealed the next one, redemption itself. There is healing in redemption, just like there's forgiveness of sin. Healing is part and parcel of the same redemptive plan. Did you know you are just as healed as you are saved? You're just as rich as you are righteous? Hmm? Whether you've believed it or not is a different thing, but it, it, it's true. It is a redemptive reality. It's true in Jesus. We saw the first fruits of our inheritance. We saw the fatherhood of God. We saw that healing is the children's bread. We saw that the mercy of God reveals his will to heal. We saw we have authority over demons and disease. We saw the ministry of Jesus reveal the will of God. And we saw last week the laying on of hands. And that was number 18, is that right? So we go on today, tonight, to number 19. We are sure it's God's will for all of us to be healed now, today, because He is the Good Shepherd. <laughs> Can you help me with this one tonight? He is the Good Shepherd. Somebody said out loud. He is... The good shepherd. Well, how would we know that proves it's his will for us to be healed? Well, just sit tight. Hold on. Go with me, if you would, to Scripture that is well known to many, the great 23rd Psalm. Now, let's get into this tonight. Psalm 23 I learned this 23rd Psalm as a little boy in Sunday school. Got me through some tight places in my youth. There were some times I didn't know anything much about what to do, but I'd just stand and say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. And he was. And he got me through. Amen. Our children need to know these things. It's sad that so many today don't know the word. It's been replaced with uh, gimmicks and all other kind of stuff. But the word will stay with you. The 23rd Psalm, what does it say? The Lord, is my the Lord is my shepherd. What? What's the next phrase? I shall not Want. I shall not want. Why? Because he's my shepherd. I don't want. Listen to some other translations. The New English says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I like that, don't you? Young's literal translation, a very accurate translation, says, uh, Jehovah is my shepherd I do not lack. Boy, it'd do us good to say this often, wouldn't it? Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I do not lack. I do not lack. The uh, Amplified, 
The Lord is my shepherd to feed, guide, and shield me. I shall not lack. I shall not lack. I do not, you, you heard that, and it's, it's borne out in the original language. I, I don't lack, and I won't lack. Why? Because he's my shepherd. And the implication is, he takes care of me. Hmm? Because he takes, he, because he is such a good shepherd, and he takes such good care of me, I don't lack, and I won't lack. Well, when you're sick, you're lacking. Hmm? More serious than lacking money, isn't it? You don't have it, not, you know, not able to leave the hospital, not able to do what you need to do. You're lacking. Do we serve a shepherd who's able to meet every need? Hmm? Does he want to meet all our needs? Has he really already provided everything we'd ever need in Jesus? Is it his will to manifest it in our lives so that we can say, I am complete and entire. I want nothing. I I lack not for for any good thing. Is that his will? Well, that would be the case with a a sheep that has a good shepherd. They would lack nothing. All of their needs are met. Uh, They're taken good care of. Keep reading. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. You know why a sheep would lie down in the middle of the day in a green pasture? Any kind of livestock. If they're hungry, they're not lying down. They're walking around trying to find something. But when you see them all laying down in the middle of the day, why? Why? It's probably because the grass is waving over their head. You can hardly see them. Why? Because their belly is so full, they just can't take anymore right now. Huh? You know why? Because they got a good shepherd that got them to a good pasture. Glory to God. How many know you follow the Lord? He'll get you to some good places. Hmm? You know, our prosperity is inseparable from his plan for our life. If you want the full will of God in prosperity, you have to find and do the full will of God for your life. Partially obedient, then you'll have a partially blessed pasture. You might know what I'm talking about? You're not going to enjoy all his benefits running from him. If the shepherd's trying to lead you to a good pasture, but no, <laughs> you got another place picked out. Hmm? And you're not going to follow him. Well, then you're going to wind up in some rough places, aren't you? And oh, this is happening all over the world. And then you got people getting mad at God. Hmm? The Bible talks about that in Proverbs. It talks about a man who uh, doesn't listen and then he gets in trouble and his heart frets against the Lord. Well, Lord, why'd you let this happen to me? Lord, why'd you do this to me? Uh, Wrong question. Wrong question. Why didn't you follow your shepherd? He would have led you to a good pasture. He would have led you to a place where you're fruitful, where people will love you and hook up with you and help you, right? How many know if you're driving somewhere and you get off the road you're supposed to be on and take a wrong turn, that you will go through places you weren't supposed to go through? Hmm? Let's say you're going from here to St. Louis, but you get off the interstate, and you take a turn, and you take a turn, and then you don't know where you are, and so you're trying to make up time, so you're going real fast, and it's raining, and you come over a a, a rise, and the road's washed out, And, and, and so you hit that, and your car flips upside down. Well, you were never supposed to be on that road to find that hole. 
to flip and wind up in the ditch. If you stayed on the right road, you'd have never felt wind up in a ditch. Right. Or you take a wrong turn, and you take a wrong turn, and you tell you somebody's trying to tell you, but no, no, I know how I'm going. I know where I'm going. Hush. No, I don't want to. Well, I, I, I've done this trip 193 times. Yeah, but I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and so you turn wrong and turn wrong and turn wrong, and you're going through a place, and there's a rough place. And you get mugged. And you get carjacked. And you get thumped on your head. And your wallet's taken away. And now you got a big knot on your head. And no money. And no car. And you say, God, I just know, why'd you put this off on me? God, why'd you put me through this? I guess I'm just, you're teaching me something. <laughs> Millions of Christians believe this. No, the reason you're there is because you wouldn't be teachable. He was trying to teach you something, but now you got to do it your way. Well, by golly, I don't care what they say. I'm my own man, and I'm going to do it my own way. Yeah, and you're going to pay too. The Lord says something to me the other day that I, I wrote down. It, it's absolutely a truth, as, as all, everything he says is. Uh, you see people all the time who are so adamant about nobody's going to tell them what to do. Right? And did you notice how often these people wind up in jail? <laughs> huh? They, they're not going to listen to the laws. Nobody can tell them. The police can't tell them what to do. The laws of the land can't tell them what to do. The less you listen to other people, the less freedom you will have. That's right. The very thing they want, now they wind up in a cement cell. And why weren't they listening to anybody? Because they want to be free <laughs> to do what they want to do. Now they're not free at all. If you won't listen to anybody, you will lose all your freedoms. But the more you listen, and the more teachable you are, the more tests you pass, the more trustworthy you become, the more the Lord and other people will turn stuff over to you, right? And give you more freedom, and give you more liberty, and you get freer, and freer, and freer, because you listen, because you're teachable. Can you see this or not? People who won't listen to anybody lose all their freedoms. But if you listen to God and obey God, you'll get freer and freer. Somebody say freer and freer. Yeah. You like that or not? Yeah. Say it out loud, the Lord's my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd. I, lack I lack nothing. Keep reading. He makes me to lie down in green, green pastures. He leads me beside the water. He's talking about deep waters. Deep waters. Waters even in the, that, that are hot in the hot day are cold and refreshing. He restoreth my soul. Now here's some restoration. Is any healing in this? Uh, in the New English, verse 3 says, He restores my strength. Say that out loud. He restores my strength. The Young's literal says, my soul he refreshes. He refreshes. The Amplified says, he refreshes and restores my life. That sounds like some healing in there, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you. Who? My good shepherd, the great shepherd. You are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. With his rod and his staff, he's able to protect us. You know, with the hook end of it, uh, the, the shepherd could reach in when the wayward sheep 
got tangled up in the briars or in the quicksand and he couldn't maybe get there without sinking himself, he could take that hook, hook around those horns or hook up under that sheep, pull them out. Pull them out of that pit. How many believe the Lord can pull you out of the pit? Get, get you out of the briar patch, right? And it is also a weapon that you can use on wolves. Huh? And when the predator's trying to eat up the, the sheep, the uh, shepherd, uh, shepherds were skilled in it. And they could put the hurt on a coyote or a wolf, or right? They could make a bear think about leaving <laughs> by putting this rod across their nose real hard, right? And so there's protection, there's deliverance, no matter if you are going through the, the valley of the shadow of death, he's with you. How many know if he's with you, you're coming out? Yeah. Come on now, if he's with you, his rod and his staff is there to guide you, direct you, protect you, deliver you, get you out. Means you're coming out. You're coming out the other side of this thing. All I got to do is stay close to the good shepherd. I mean, if, you, if you're a little sheep and you know that there's mountain lions and grizzly bears and uh, wolves and they all want lamb for supper <laughs> and you had any smarts, what would you do? You would stick close, <laughs> right? Close to your good shepherd. I mean, if he stops, you're to run into him. Right? <laughs> if you're smart. How many remember the Bible said Peter, the night that he got, he missed it and betrayed, well, uh, I shouldn't say betrayed, denied the Lord, said he followed afar off. You remember that? You get in trouble when you follow afar off. See, there's so many people, they, just, they, they don't want to, I've actually had people ask me, and say, well, Brother Keith, how worldly you think you could be and still be saved? <laughs> Who wants to know? <laughs> and why? Huh? And a lot of more folk didn't say it, but are trying. They, you know, like the little boy that kept falling out of bed and thump, mama came, he's crying. He said, son, what happened? You fall, how come you fall out of bed again? He said, I guessed I stayed too close to where I got in at. <laughs> what does that mean? He's sleeping on the edge. Well, if you just move a little bit on the edge, you're going to fall out. What if you're up in the middle of the bed? You're all the way in the middle. Well, even if you move some, you're still in the bed. Right? And if you try to see how close to the edge you can stay, you are not smart because there are wolves out there and there are grizzly bears. Right? And tigers. And they're all wanting you for lunch. And you cannot handle them on your own. You're not that smart. You're not that strong in your own strength. Oh, but your shepherd is. I said, oh, your shepherd is. He whips that rod around and says, I said, get. They get, they get. And if you're smart, you'll be right up against his pants leg going, that's right, get. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and you can be sassy and you go, nah, 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 nah. You can't eat me, but you best not leave. Right? You best not leave the good shepherd. <laughs> you better stay close. Somebody stay, say, stay close. The psalmist also said, my soul follows hard after you. What does that mean? I'm, I'm right on you, Lord. I'm right on you. In other words, you stop, boom, I'm going to hit you in the back. If you're smart, that's how you'll endeavor to live. Just as close as you know how. Right? 
just as committed. You know how? Because nobody can afford to do otherwise. Nobody can. He said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Again, that's no lack now, is it? That is no lack. Table fully spread and prepared. Abundance. Not empty cup. Not half full cup. Not fill up to the brim. Overflowing. My cup runs over. That's the God of abundance. Yes. I thought about the question one time studying this passage. I thought, doesn't God know when the cup is full? <laughs> Wouldn't he know when you put the very last drop that you could put in it that it would hold? Well, then why does he run it over? Why does he run it over? I mean, that's a spill. Isn't it? You run it over, cup overflows, that means it's on the table now. Now it's off in the floor. Maybe running out the door. <laughs> Somebody said, that's wasteful. No, that's God. That's God. Why does he do that? He wants to remind you. I'm a God of abundance. I'm a God of excess. I'm a God of too much. Right? That's why you do not lack. You do not want for any good thing because your good shepherd's the God of abundance. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Can you see this all flows together? See, my cup runs over prefaces goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. What does that mean? You come through like a blessing ship. Like a blessing. But what do you leave in your wake? Huh? Goodness. Huh? Mercy. So my God's doing it. Yeah, but he's doing it through you. Yes, sir. And, and how, what, what kind of goodness? Because your cup is overflowing. You have abundance. You have surplus to bless when you come through. Excess, surplus. Your cup runs over. And so because of that, you can leave goodness and mercy in your wake. Everywhere you go, you can leave people, you know, praising the Lord. And why? Because... The Lord is my shepherd. Now go with me to Ezekiel 34 and let's see more clearly what this has to do with healing. Because what we said to you is we are sure it's God's will for all of us to be healed today because he is our good shepherd. We're going to Ezekiel 34. Now I can see healing all through that 23rd Psalm myself. Can you? If I don't want, then I don't want. The Lord is my shepherd. I do not want. I don't want for forgiveness. I don't want for righteousness. Hmm? I don't want for fellowship with Him. I don't want for being cleansed, being made holy, being made right in His sight. I don't want peace for my mind. I don't lack strength for my soul. The Lord's my shepherd. I don't lack healing. I don't lack health. I don't lack strength. I don't lack days of life to finish my course and do what I'm put here to do. I don't lack money. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack money. I don't lack stuff. I don't lack help. I just don't lack. Lack, want for nothing. Amen. Do not lack. Amen. Because he is good. Yes. He's good. Yes. Now what we're going to begin to see as we get into Ezekiel 34 here, we'll keep coming back to this, the condition of the sheep is a reflection on the shepherd. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Right. Yeah. Isn't it? 
Say that out loud. The condition of the sheep is a reflection on the shepherd. It speaks to the quality of the shepherd. Doesn't it? Does God have a double standard? Hmm? Does he hold us to a standard that he himself does not adhere to? Because he's above it. Some people try to say so. But how could that be just? How could it be? If I say, now y'all tithe, but I'm not, because I'm the preacher. Huh? No, the Bible tells us uh, as good, well, go to uh, 1 Peter. Hold your place in Ezekiel. 1 Peter 5, last chapter of 1 Peter. He said, the elders, verse 1, that are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, who also, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 2, what, what did he say to, to the elders? Feed the flock of God. Well, is he talking about sheep or people? He, he's using this symbolism because there are similarities but he's talking about people are you part of a flock we all are right and there is the great shepherd and he has appointed under shepherds hasn't he and what's the under shepherds supposed to do feed the flock with what peanut butter and jelly Hot dogs and hamburgers, what? <laughs> Feed the flock of God with the Word. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You're supposed to come get fed when you come to church. Hmm? Now some things you like to eat better than others, don't you? In the natural, Right? And uh, if we have a time in the service where nobody's shouting, that don't mean the food's bad necessarily. Because you don't need ice cream and potato chips all the time. You, you, you know, vegetables. <laughs> I see people turning up their nose already. But there's some things you need. You need some minerals. You need some vitamins. You know, I started saying years ago, if it's good for me, I like it. And boy, there was some stuff I didn't like. But I started eating it by faith. I thought, well, if it's good for me, I like it. You know, if you say I can't stand that and I can't eat that for 30 years, what's going to happen? You are not going to be able to stand it, right? But if it's something you ought to have, go ahead and put your words on it. Oh, everybody's overjoyed about that, aren't they? I'm, I'm telling you how to make it easier on yourself. Somebody said, well, I got by so far without it. Yeah, but you ain't done. <laughs> you could have a long ways to go, and you just want to do what the Lord directs you to do and be happy about it. Use your words to help yourself. He said, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being what? In samples, or modern translations say, examples of the flock. We're supposed to lead how? Not just by teaching and precept, but by example. And nobody wants to follow somebody that doesn't practice what they preach. Or doesn't live what they preach. Hmm? And I don't know about you, but it's a full-time job with me just living everything I've preached. (laughs) 
Because I, be, I may be especially anointed to teach and preach it, but I'm not any more anointed to live it than anybody else. Right? And if you're preaching something and don't live it, you're a hypocrite. You too. <laughs> right? There's no two sets of rules. So everybody wants there to be another set of rules for the preachers than for the rest of the believers, but it's not. It's not. We're supposed to live by a, a lead by example. He said not, not be just being lords over the, God's heritage, but examples to the flock. Paul talked about that. Follow me as I follow the Lord. Right? Well, what about the Lord? What's he doing? Is he saying, do this, but doing something else? Is the Father God saying, do this, but he's not doing it? Is he saying, you're supposed to take care of your own? If you don't provide for your own, you've denied the, the faith and the worse than an infidel, and he doesn't provide for his own? Does he have a double standard? I assure you, God is the definition of just yes. and fair yes. and perfect yes. and right. Yes. And he never told you to do anything he hasn't already done yes. and is doing yes. to perfection. Yes. He's our example. Yes. Jesus did it following the Father's example, and we're to follow his example. Well, notice this. With that in mind, notice in Ezekiel 34 now. Because he really reproves and corrects some shepherds in this chapter. I mean, he's, he's getting on them. And they need to be got on. The stuff they were doing. But who is the great shepherd? Uh, the Lord is. You know, God the Father himself is called a shepherd as well. In Genesis, don't turn there. <clears throat> You're going to Ezekiel 34. But in Genesis 49, 24, this is the NIV, the King James is similar. He said, uh, the mighty one of Jacob, the shepherd, the rock of Israel. The mighty one of Jacob, who is that? That's God the Almighty. That's the Father. The, he's also called the shepherd and the rock of Israel. Is he the rock? Yes. Is he your rock? Yes. Is he also your father? Yes. Is he also your shepherd? Yes. Is he a good one? Yes. Well, what do good shepherds do? They take care of the flock, right? In every way? Every way. Look at this. Ezekiel 34. Now we're answering the question, is it God's will to heal all? Chapter 34, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, saying to the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. And as you keep reading, you'll find he's not talking about them shepherding sheep or goats. He's talking about the leaders of the people. Say to them, thus says the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flocks. How can you tell a real shepherd? Hmm? They're going to be feeding. Right? You ever seen a rancher come through on his tractor? Or especially in wintertime when there's no grass around? Those cows know the sound of that truck. Don't they? Yeah. Those sheep or those uh, uh, horses or yeah. livestock, they know the sound of that tractor. Yeah. They hear it when it starts up. <laughs> and they'll all leave and start coming to the fence row, won't they? Yeah. All come up by a trail. Yeah. And when the farmer comes out, how do you know it's really the rancher? He's not just sightseeing trying to pet the cows. <laughs> He'll have something in the wagon. Right? He will have something in the wagon. Yes, sir. 
Now, yeah, he, he drinks the milk, and he eats the products, and he enjoys, but he's going to feed. He feeds, yes. feeds, feeds, yes. feeds, 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 and takes care of. Well, these guys weren't doing that. Verse 3, you eat the fat and clothe you with the wool and you kill them that are fed. But you feed not the flock, abusing the flock and not feeding the flock. Now look at verse 4. Are you there? Tell me what it says. The diseased you have not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Neither have you brought again that which driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. Now see, that's what he was saying in First Peter. Not just not being lords and oppressors over the flock, but examples. Somebody say examples. They were scattered because there's no shepherd. They became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. So they weren't protected. They weren't fed. They weren't cared for. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Is he reproving them? Is he rebuking them? Sternly. And, and a whole verse here has to do with they didn't minister to the sick. Right? Put it back up there. What is it? Verse 4. The diseased have you not strengthened? Is he reproving them? Yes. You didn't take care of the sick. Right? right. Well, what about him? I said, what about him? Does he take care of his sick? Yes. 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 What about the good shepherd? Yes. Would he reprove under shepherds like that and rebuke them while he himself does not take care of his own? No, he would not. Is he the good shepherd? Yes, he is. Think about it. The condition of the sheep is reflection on the shepherd. What kind of shepherd they are. How good of a shepherd they are. What kind of shepherd we got? Good. Good. Not, not mediocre. Huh? What kind of shepherd we got? Good shepherd. Good. Good shepherd. Somebody say good shepherd. Good shepherd. Good. Come on, say it again. Close your eyes. Say, good shepherd. He's a good shepherd. What does a good shepherd do? Takes good care of the flock. What if you grew up over in the Middle East or in Africa, any number of places where they still shepherd sheep and livestock just like they did these centuries ago, and you grew up in a little village, and you, all your life you kept hearing about this great shepherd. Kept hearing about him. Legendary. And one day you hear, he's coming to town. He's coming through the village. You thought, oh man, I've heard about him. Great shepherd. And so you go out to the, to the road, and you see some dust coming down. And yeah, there's somebody. And yeah, there's a flock behind him. Oh yeah, this is him. And so the closer he gets, you begin to go, whoo. Boy, oh, he, noble features, fine robes, ornamented staff. You go, ooh, that, that's got to be him. That's got to be him. Man, he's something. And the more you look at him, the more impressive he is. And you're just oohing and aahing and thinking, oh, my, my, my. He is something. And then you look down at the sheep and go, oh, oh. Because they're a pitiful looking bunch. <laughs> Little ribs poking out. Look like they hadn't been fed in weeks. 
There's one, obviously, some kind of predator got a hold of him and chewed his ear up. and It hadn't been tended to, hadn't been bandaged. There's one, got a little broke leg, and he's just dragging it along behind him. Sheep are malnourished. Sheep haven't been protected. You got ones that's got open wounds, and they're sick and diseased. They've been allowed to get infected. It's, it's going to kill them. They haven't been treated. What would you say? Hmm? What would you say? You say, well, I don't care what he looks like. He's not a good shepherd. Because if he's a good shepherd, it'd be seen in the condition of the sheep. Right? Oh, can you see this? I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit in some of the points to come, but... Uh, we are His glory. Yes. <laughs> Did you know that? Yes. We are His glory. And the devil has lied through preachers' mouths for centuries that if we're really consecrated and humble, we'll probably be sick and broke and defeated. But some way or another, that glorifies God in our bearing with our lack and diseased and poor condition. No, it's a bad reflection on our shepherd. We're failing, we're being destroyed, we're, we're going under and tell people, well, yeah, the Lord's teaching us something and the Lord's working something out and then turn around and go, don't you want to join the flock? <laughs> and what are they going to say? I don't think so. No. They've already got a shepherd like that that's not a shepherd, a thief, a wolf, right, that steals and kills and destroys, and it's not the Lord. I know you've heard some of this before, but friend, most of the church world has not believed it yet. It's not the broker you are and the weaker you are and the more defeated you are that some way or another makes your shepherd look good. Right. It's when everybody else is going under, but you go over. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everything else said you'd have to fail, but you come out. Yes. Oh, come on now. Yes. Your bills are paid when nobody else is. Yes. Your kids are, are healthy when everybody else is sick. Yes. You overcome when everybody else has to die with it. Yes. Oh, come on, come on. After a while, people get to seeing that. Yes. And they'll come to you. It might be on the job. It may be across the fence at, at the house. It may be at, at the grocery store. And they go, how do you do it? <laughs> Man, you're something. <laughs> you go, you think I'm something? You ought to see my master. <laughs> it's not the more beat down. It's the more glorious and victorious our life is, it glorifies our Lord. Yes. How do you do it? How do you keep doing that? I got a good shepherd. Yes. I got a good shepherd, and, and he takes good care of us. And, by the way, we're still taking applications for the flock. People want a shepherd like that. Don't they? That'll heal them. That'll meet their needs. That'll bless them. That'll protect them. And if a shepherd doesn't do that, then I don't care who he is. He's not a good shepherd. Whether it's me, whether it's you, whether it's the Lord himself. If you don't take care of the sheep, you're not a good shepherd. Huh? This doesn't work. How come we're sure it's God's will for all of us to be healed today? Because he is the Good shepherd. Woo, hallelujah. Come on, I got a little bit more for you. Come on. Ezekiel 34. 34. He reproved them. He corrected them because they weren't taking care of the sheep. And verse 4, he mentions specifically the diseased you didn't strengthen. You didn't heal the ones that were sick. You didn't bind up what was broken. Verse 11. So here's what he says he's going to do. Verse 11. Thus says the Lord, God, behold, even I 
I, even I, what does that mean? I myself. They didn't take care of them. But it's my sheep. And I myself, I'm going to both search out my sheep and I'm going to seek them out as a shepherd seeks his flock in the day that he's among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and I'll deliver them out of all the places where they've been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. I'll bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries. I'll bring them to their own land and I'll feed them on the mountains of Israel by the rivers and all the inhabited places of the country. I'll feed them in a good pasture. Sound like Psalm 23, don't it? Yeah. On the high mountains of Israel their fold will be. They will lie in a good fold. Yeah. And in a fat pasture yeah. shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. Sounds like eating the good of the land to me. Yeah. Sound like prosperity. Sound like richness. Yeah. Doesn't it you? Yeah. I will feed my flock. I'll cause them to lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. And get this, get this. I will bind up that which was broken. I will strengthen that which was sick. Who's talking? Come on, tell me. Who's talking? The shepherd. The good shepherd. He said, you didn't do it. Those guys that were abusing the flock and not feeding them. He said, you didn't do it. He reproved them. He corrected them. And he said, I'm going to do it. Yes. I'm going to take care of my sheep. Yes. And he mentions specifically, I'm going to bind up what was broken and I will strengthen that which was sick. If he's a good shepherd, he heals his sick sheep. If he's a good shepherd, he protects his sheep in danger. Yeah. If he's a good shepherd, he feeds his hungry sheep. Yeah. He shelters his sheep. Yeah. Oh, come on, do you believe it? Yeah. Somebody says, well, well, why are so many of them not? Well, back to the thing we are talking about earlier. Isaiah 53 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all gone our own way. Well, when you, you know there's the shepherd, you know he's leading you that way, and you're hard-headed and stubborn, you're going to take off on your own, well, you're not going to be in the fat pasture. Right, right. Hmm? Right. You're not going to be protected. You're not going to be healed. You're not going to get all the benefits. But what if you are a smart little sheep? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Smart little sheep. How, about, how many smart little sheep I got in here? Let me see. Smart little sheep. If you're smart, you're not rebellious. You're not stubborn. You're not unteachable. You're not hard headed. You're not disobedient. Say it out loud. I'm an obedient sheep. Where he leads, I follow. And I stay close. Because there's tigers out there. <laughs> <laughs> Go to John 10. <laughs> yeah, there's tigers out there. John 10. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I do not lack. I will not lack. John 10. Anybody know what this chapter is about? John 10. It's got red letters in here. Hmm? Red letters better than cash money. <laughs> right? Red letters better than gold. It's better than anything. The words of the master, you can build your life on them. He said, verse 1, John 10, verily, Verily, I say to you, if he said it, it'd be true. But then he says, verily, verily. That means, boy, you ought to listen from your scalp to your toes. Going, hmm, this is a big word. What? He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, who, who is the door? Skip down to verse 7. Verily, verily, there's another verily, verily. I say to you, I am, here's one of these great I am statements. I am the door 
of the sheep. Well, then some, uh, somebody that comes through the door comes through him, right. comes by him. And if somebody comes up another way, they're not a real shepherd and they got ulterior motives. They're there for something else. You know, Paul said about people that helped him. He, he was telling some individuals about Timothy. He said, uh, I don't have anybody like-minded like him. He said, because all seek their own. But he cares for you like I do. I paraphrased a little bit, but that's what he said. So many people are looking for something else. They, they're trying to build their own thing. They're trying to feather their own nest. But a real shepherd, what's he after? Huh? First concern is the welfare of the sheep. Right? Condition of the sheep. And so anybody that, that is a true uh, shepherd, true leader, is going to come through the door. They're going to, the Lord's the one that brought them in. He's the one that did it. Not just elected by some committee. Hmm? Did you know some are sent and some just went? Right? A lot of them. And you got all kind of churches. They change pastors like changing the sheets on the bed. Right? They just do it every year or two whether they feel like they need it or not. Just, you know, shake things up. Well, all that can't be God. All is changing and appointing and, and moving and people are missing it. And it costs the church. And you got people that come in and know they're not going to be there but a year or two. And so not, not everybody. There's some good people that are doing these things. But some are just, you know, they see what they can get out of it. But Jesus is the good shepherd. And he's not just trying to see what he can get out of you. His first concern is taking care of you. He said, uh, he that enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Aren't you glad you got somebody leading you? You going to have somebody leading you in the morning? And tomorrow afternoon? On the job? At home? You got somebody leading you in every decision that you need to make? He's leading you. He calls his own sheep by name. Somebody say, he knows my name. He knows my name name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. He's not the good cowboy. No slant on cowboys, just cowboys drive the herd. Shepherds lead, right? And that's why he said shepherd instead of something else. Well, what's the, why are you saying that, Brother Keith? Because it's up to the flock whether they follow or not. Nobody's behind them pushing them. The shepherd calls, come on. Come on, Keith. Come on. And it's up to Keith. Right? Whether I go or don't. Now, if I had any sense, I know. There's tigers out there. And he knows where the good water is. And he knows where the good pasture is. Right? And he knows where the protected coves are. And the shelters. He knows. And I don't. So if I was smart, when he says, Keith, what would I do? I would, I would trot. I would, I would run. Right? Till I bumped into his leg. Like, oh, yeah, here I am. Got something good for me today, don't you? I know you do. I am your sheep. I'm nobody's, I'm your sheep. I'm stay with you. Right? And notice what it goes on to say. Oh, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. A stranger they will not follow. They'll flee from him. They'll run from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Verse 7, Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he'll go in and out and find pasture. He's talking about being satisfied in your life. 
being well fed, well taken care. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Do you think that doesn't include healing? We know it does from Ezekiel 34. I am the good shepherd. Yes, you are. Yes, he is. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, and he did. And he did. Did you know the verse? In fact, hold your place right there. Go to 1 Peter. I want you to notice what is next door to the verse that talks about our shepherd. What flows right into it. 1 Peter, chapter 3, this was not written in chapter and verse. So back up and look at the last verse of 2, 225. 225, are you with me? For you were as sheep going astray, that's past tense, were, used to be, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. That's verse 25. Anybody know what was right before that? Verse 24. <laughs> Which says, By whose stripes you were healed. What's a really good shepherd? A really good shepherd is one who would go take the beating for you. So you wouldn't have to take it. And he did. A good shepherd wants you healed. And is willing to pay whatever it takes to get, get it that way. And he did. I said he did. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Somebody say it out loud. He is my shepherd. And by his stripes I'm healed. Glory. Say it one more time. Let's say it together. He is my shepherd. He is my shepherd. And by his, stripes, by his stripes, I'm healed. I'm healed. Say it again. He, he is, is my, my shepherd. shepherd. And by his stripes, I am healed. Hallelujah. He's my shepherd. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Glory. Glory to God. That's why we know it's his will. Hallelujah. For all the sheep to be healed. Yes. Now. Well, I don't feel it. That's got little to do with it. <laughs> Where do we find the will of God? This is it. And if you believe it and stay with it, what you feel will change. What you see will change. We look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. Because the things that are seen are temporal, temporary. Everything you see is temporary. Subject to, subject to change. Most everything you see used to be different. Huh? If it changed from that to this, it could change from this to something else. Everything you see and feel is changing and can be changed. But the things that are not seen are eternal. They don't change. Go back to John 10. I think I can finish up with this. Find, find Matthew 12 and hold on to John 10. We'll just go right from there to there. Matthew 12. John 10, then we're going to Matthew 12. Just look with me in John 10 right now if you need to turn later. He said, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Who has come? Jesus. Very next phrase says what? Who came? The good shepherd came. Why? So you could have the abundant, overflowing, surplus life. Too much kind of life. The Lord is my shepherd. I. That's abundant life. You're not lacking. You're not wanting. You're not in need. Oh, this is wonderful. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. 
He said, he that's a hireling and not the shepherd who's owned the sheep or not sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. He says it again. Is he? Yes, he is. He said it once. It would have been true. Keep saying it. Why? It's a great truth for eternity. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. Somebody say, he knows me, and I know him, and he's my good shepherd. I won't follow a stranger, but I follow him fully. He said, as the Father loves me, knows me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them I'll bring. They'll hear my voice. There'll be one fold and one shepherd. Did you know there's not going to be any Baptist parts of heaven or Pentecost parts of heaven or Word of Faith parts of heaven or Catholic parts of heaven? One, one, one fold, one flock, one shepherd. Therefore does my Father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Man, this is so good. Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. Who's bigger than the shepherd? Then why does the wolf get so many of them? I've already told you twice. Why? All we like sheep have gone astray, left the flock, gone off on their own, doing their own thing. But if you stay close to Him, you stay in His will, you obey Him, can anything overpower Him? Is there anything big enough, bad enough, terrible enough to rip you out of the hand of your shepherd and take you out from His care and His protection? Nothing. Nobody. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the hand of our great shepherd. What did he say? My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man, actually it just means nothing, is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Man, when you're pressing up against the leg of the shepherd, You are safe. There is no disease. There is no devil. There is no curse. There is no accident. There is nothing that can get past him or through him or over him because he is greater than all. Can you say amen? Amen. Now finally. Did you know Paul said finally, brethren, halfway through (laughs) Philippians? He did, so I'm in good company. This is my second closing. What do you care? Where are you going? You in a rush? Matthew 12. What we're talking about here tonight is true forever. It's true forever. You can live on this the rest of your life. Not my words, not my thoughts. He said, I am the good shepherd. Nothing, nobody can pluck you out of my hand. The Father that gave them me is greater than all. And nobody can pluck you out of his hand. Matthew 12. Now here's what I want you to notice. We're still answering the question. We've already answered it, but we're just confirming it. So I don't want you to think that the reason we believe in healing is because I preached a fast message one time. (laughs) And we got excited. Hmm? We've given scripture after scripture, haven't we? Verse after verse, truth after truth. The Bible said in the mouth of two or three witnesses. We're at reason number 19, right? And we're sure. Matthew 12, 10, there was a man that had a withered hand. They asked him, they said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? Matthew 12, 10. 
that they might accuse him. And he said to them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one, what? One sheep. And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Now, what, why is he saying this? Because a, a man here has is, is got a withered hand. Sickness. Disease. And he compares it to an animal in distress. Doesn't he? Just about any Christian that would try to argue with you that it might not be God's will to heal you all the time. If their little dog is tied up in a fence, their little cat is fell down in a ditch, would you ever see them go out there and kneel down by the fence and go, Lord, now I know Kitty needs help, but I realize it might not be your will to help Kitty. <laughs> huh? I know my dog is hungry. I've seen him out there looking at the bow for three days. <laughs> but I'm just not sure if it's your will. He's sick. I see him out there laying, panting. He needs help. But I understand it might not be your will for him to be healed. Why would that be any different than what Christians say they believe about God in church? Are we not his sheep? Now, I know some folk don't like this, but does he have two, a double standard? No. Does he? No. Is he going to reprove and correct shepherds but not feeding the sheep and caring for the sick, and he himself does not? Yes, if we believe this, it might not be his will always to heal. We ought to be consistent with our own pets and livestock. Shouldn't we? We ought to pray and go, I know my cow's in the ditch, but... I got to see if it's God's will to get her out. People laugh at that. They go, oh, that's ridiculous. Not any more ridiculous than you saying it might not be God's will to heal you. Right. Not any more. And these are not my words. Remember, I'm reading what Jesus said. Right. Come on now, are you with me or not? I didn't make this up. Right. I'm reading what he said. Right. Come on, read with me. Read with me. What did he say? Verse 11, somebody's got a sheep. It falls in a pit on the Sabbath day. Will he not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Yes. Verse 13, he said to the man, stretch your hand out. And he stretched it forth and it was restored. It was healed just like the other one. Yes. Glory. Glory to God. Glory. Hallelujah. You got enough sense to feed your dog? Yes. You got enough sense to get your cat out of the the fence wire? You got enough sense to get your pet out of the pit? Yes, sir. Yes. Come on. And yet, try to sit up in church and say it might not be God's will to get you out of your problem no. and your mess. That's not the only time he said it. Don't turn there, but Luke 13. Luke 13, the woman with the spirit of infirmity. When he healed her, they got mad about it. And he said, you hypocrite. Every one of you will loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering. And not not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan is bound, lo, these 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. Right. Second time, he compared a person in sickness to an animal in distress. Amen. Third time, Luke 14. There was a certain man that had the dropsy. This is somebody swollen with fluids. Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? They held their peace. He took him and healed him and let him go. And he told them, Which one of you, having an ass or an ox fallen into a pit, will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? Three times. He compares people being sick to animals in distress. And if you don't pray over helping animals in distress, you ought not pray if it's God's will for you to be healed or not. If you believe the Bible, say it out loud. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Stand up on your feet and say it out loud. The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. The, Lord the Lord is my shepherd. 
I will not lack. The Lord is my good shepherd. I will always be fed. He prepares a table of abundance in front of me. He anoints my head with oil. Oil's a type of healing anointing. Say it out loud, my cup runs over. I do not lack. I do not want. He's my good shepherd. He leads me. He feeds me. He heals me. He protects me. He's my good shepherd. Oh, let's praise him a little bit for it. Father, we bless your holy name. Glory to your holy name. Glory to your holy name.